Good afternoon and welcome to The Contrarians. I'm Peter Van Onselen. The big news this week didn't come out of Canberra despite Parliament sitting. It came out of Melbourne, Victoria with the release of a Royal Commission report into the bushfires from earlier this year. The interesting thing about this report, and it's a very detailed report, but the interesting thing about it is that despite having 51 recommendations in the report, and we have to stress it's only a draft, despite having 51 recommendations, despite having 480 plus suggestions about the issue of burn back and problems with fuel in the area, there was absolutely no recommendations amongst those 51 that pertained to the issue of having to cut fuel in the area. The reality is that the situation in Victoria is one that is pretty unique to Victoria with the level of problems with the bushfires. When you look around the rest of the country, the issue of dealing with fuel is the problem that needs to be addressed. Yet for some reason, for some reason, the Royal Commission has not dealt with that whatsoever. In Western Australia, where it is hotter, where it is drier and where it is also windier, burn back is something that is naturally used by fire authorities right around the southwest region of the state. It helps to prevent bushfires and it's an important thing to be happening. But yet we haven't seen anything referred to about that in the report. The other thing is we shouldn't forget 173 deaths have occurred as a result of the bushfires earlier this year. It's a staggering figure. Lives have been lost. Uh, people's lives have been completely turned upside down in the process. Family that have survived. Yet despite that, not one person, not one official has taken responsibility to the point where they've lost their job over this. Now, it's not about an exercise of pushing blame onto people. That's not the point. But it is about the community feeling like action is being taken. And despite there being a Royal Commission with far-reaching powers, despite there being a mass of people that have come in suggesting different things that have been done, not one of the recommendations has addressed the key issue of fuel in the area. Now, we're going to be talking later to Fran Bailey about this. This is an important issue. She's the local member for McEwen, which takes in the fire-ravaged area. But one of the things that has to be thought about in this particular debate is why aren't fossil fuel, why isn't fossil fuel burning rather an issue? Why is it the green movement? Are there concerns there uh, that are political concerns? We're going to explore all of those issues in a moment with Fran Bailey. In our Melbourne Bureau, we have Fran Bailey, the member for McEwen. Thank you very much for joining us on the program today. Thank you, Peter. Fran, can I start, obviously, with the bushfires? You must have known people that, that lost their lives in the fires, and no doubt you've been talking to people uh, that, that are trying to recover in the aftermath of it as they rebuild their lives. What's the reaction from the local communities to, uh, to this Royal Commission report that was handed down this week? There's been mixed reaction, Peter. Um, firstly, I think the Commission is to be commended for placing a priority on the protection of human life above property. And they have made some very significant recommendations about that. And people were very pleased to see that. However, as you've said in your introduction, the most number of submissions that the Commission received on any one issue was to do with fuel reduction, 485 mm. submissions, and there was no recommendation. People are bewildered by that, um, and they're quite angry about that um, because it is such a significant issue. Victoria now has been in drought for 13 years. We have fuel loads at at least 10 times what they should be in many areas, pristine areas like the Upper Yarra Valley, the Dandenongs, the Macedon Ranges. And these are areas, of course, which have been nominated by the state government as being in the top 52 most high-prone fire areas to watch out for this coming season. What, why do you think it is? 485 recommendations about dealing with fuel as an issue, 51 recommendations, 51 um, recommendations out of the Royal Commission report, yet not one of them dealing with that. Why do you think that the Royal Commissioner didn't see fit to include some reference at least uh, to a recommendation around those 485 submissions? 
Well, I'm as bewildered as everyone else, and maybe it's that they uh, they simply have not had the opportunity to really to drill down into the, all of those submissions about fuel reduction. But, Peter, you know, I think that there is, uh, in, in Australia, I think people think that the only way to achieve fuel reduction is by burning. Now, that's actually not um, the main method that is used in so many European countries that have very similar wildfires to what we have in Australia. What are the methods? I've recently returned and, and went into World Heritage listed areas in Portugal where there are teams of people out clearing the roadsides. Their roadsides are cleared 10 metres on each side and, and they manage to achieve this in World Heritage listed areas. But here in Australia we have this constant battle with local government authorities who actually uh, fine and penalise people mm. for trying to clear um, trees and bushes from around their homes. And I, and I think they're sometimes referred to as fire breaks and, and in my introduction when I was talking about Western Australia, I know that you know, having lived there for the last five years, fire breaks uh, in, in rural communities is something that isn't just recommended, it's insisted upon and it's enforced. Why, why do you think that communities in, in somewhere that's so fire prone because of the mountains in Victoria don't have fire breaks? Look, it, it's just the balance has got out of skew, Peter. Um, we have had, I could take you to areas up in the Dandenongs just east of Melbourne where there have been designated fire breaks and they've actually got gates across them and the local council has erected a sign saying conservation area and they're completely overgrown. So if a fire vehicle needed to access that route or people needed to access, access that route to get out of their area, they mm. wouldn't be able to do so. And of course this is what we found in the Black Saturday fires. Many, many people lost their lives tragically because in many of our small rural communities there is only one road in and out. And if that road is clogged with um, trees and, and a lot of debris falling onto the roadway because it's so clogged, uh, people simply couldn't get out and, and they died in their cars. And this is the point, isn't it? The Royal Commission report has put so much emphasis on the need to save lives, not saving property. But if they're serious about saving lives, then things like fire breaks are central to that when you have these access points where there is only one road. Yes, I, look, I can only agree with you that it's, it's fire access routes and, and making sure that our roadsides are clear, but it's also making sure that um, throughout our forested areas, many of which, of course, um, abut um, many of our rural properties, that, that we haven't got this huge build-up of fuel on the, on the floor of the forest. As I've said, you know, CSIRO scientists have, have actually told me that, you know, where in the Yarra Valley, for example, where it, the maximum fuel load should be around four tonnes per acre, we're looking at 40 tonnes per acre. Now, you get the conditions that we had on Black Saturday and you get that fuel load, you can get no other result than a fire that burns at those extraordinary high temperatures. And, and, and sadly, mm. we, we had the, the terrible, terrible loss of life. Yeah, and, and again, I mean, in terms of the report, the recommendations talk about the need for fire prevention, not just response. And, and part of prevention is this whole issue of dealing with fuel. And, and you wonder whether the, the Australian Greens have, have something to answer for here, because it does strike me that there's been some pandering to green politics as one of the reasons that we haven't moved towards having more, more burn back. Well, I can tell you a recent discussion I had with a Green councillor in my own area who berated me for taking what I thought was a very balanced approach. And she said to me, but you must understand that um, a fallen log is habitat for some animal. Mm. Well, my response is get real. We actually had more than a million animals that, that were burnt in the Black Saturday fires. Mm, no. And, you know, when it comes down to an argument between a human life and a tree, well, the human life must take precedent. Yep, no, well said. Uh, can I move on to another issue? The front page of today's News Limited tabloids, the Daily Telegraph here in Sydney, uh, had a story about electoral entitlements uh, with you know, this, uh, an Auditor General's draft report that's come out uh, talking about misuse of entitlements by some members of Parliament. Um, did you see that report? No, I haven't seen it, but I've been aware that there's been a, um, an, an audit um, uh, review 
Do you have some concerns about this? Because it's for both sides of politics. The, the Auditor General's draft report seems to be very critical uh, of both the Liberal and the Labor Party on some of these misuses of entitlements. Do you, uh, is, is that the kind of thing that you'd like to see you know, much more insight going into to, to try to get to the bottom of it, to stamp it out? Well, Peter, from my colleagues that I've spoken to on both sides of Parliament, I think that we're, 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 we're all rather confused by the ANO's stance because before we use these entitlements, for example, putting out a newsletter into our our electorates, we actually submit that to the department and we get approval before um, that goes off to be printed. So I think most of us are, are left scratching our heads and saying, well, you know, as far as we're concerned, we we believe that we've complied with all of the department's guidelines. So well, cause the suggestion uh, I'm not quite in the, sure well, where the ANO is going with this. Well, the suggestion in the report is that um, entitlements that should be used for printing and these sorts of things have been used for purchasing chocolates. Uh, things that seem quite, quite removed and quite separate uh, from electoral entitlements usage. Oh, well, I haven't heard that. All I've heard, Peter, is... You're not is, purchasing uh, any chocolates or anything like that? No, no, I'm not, no. <laughs> I can assure you of that, no. Um, uh, I certainly use my entitlement for my newsletters um, to go out into my electorate. I've got one of the uh, the biggest and most diverse electorates and uh, the uh, one of the best ways to get out there. I must say, these days, I use some um, more electronic means. I'm, my office is very electronic. Electronic, and I have to say that mm. I've been so uh, consumed by all of the work in my uh, fire-ravaged areas that um, I haven't mm. actually sent out too much. In fact, I think I've only done one newsletter in the last 12 months. But I think that's a, it's a very important tool for all members of parliament to be able to communicate and to get feedback from their constituents. Sure. Well, because one of the other issues in the report, or the draft report, was that... Um, that there's a sort of a cartel forming in a sense of people, of organisations, they didn't name them, uh, that are doing the printing uh, on behalf of parliamentarians uh, and some of those organisations it seems are then donating back to both sides of politics. So it looks like there's at least more that has to be looked into there to make sure that it's all above board. Well, I certainly haven't heard that. As far as I'm aware, most of us tend to use small businesses in our own electorates to do the printing. It's certainly what I do, and, and, and as far as I'm aware, that's what my colleagues on both sides of politics do. Sure. Friend Bailey, we're going to have to leave it there. I know how busy you are and obviously going through responding to your constituents over, uh, over this Bushfires Royal Commission report that's been handed down. Thank you very much for giving us the time to come in there and, uh, and be with us. That's a pleasure, Peter. We've uh, got to throw to a commercial break. Uh, we'll be back in a moment.